नमस्कार व्यूअर्स दिस इज द सेकेंड सेक्शन ऑफ दिस कोर्स ऑन इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी इन द फर्स्ट सेक्शन वी डिस्कस्ड द हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी नेचर ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी एंड वॉट आर द सब्जेक्ट मैथड्स इन इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी द फर्स्ट सेक्शन वॉज डिजाइन टू इंट्रोड्यूस यू to this field of engineering psychology so that later sections can be built upon it and the knowledge that you get from the first section help you correlate how the various sections are interrelated with each other in today's section which is section 2 i will introduce you to the research methods which is used in engineering psychology now these research methods are not explicitly used for engineering psychology per se but this can be used in any behavioral uh, science experiments so let's start this section on research methods and how these research methods help us in understanding engineering psychology or the subject matter of engineering psychology i'll start today's lecture with a scenario one basic premise in cognitive psychology is that attention is limited cognitive resources which the brain uses in the process of attention is very wisely used by the brain also attention is very fluctuating in nature and mostly the brain decides in such a way that attentions are given to important task and all other tasks which are habitual or repetitive are given lesser attention this process of giving lesser attention or diverting lesser cognitive resources is called optimization of attention one fact which we are all familiar with the driving experience is that people often drive while using their cell phones now we have already established that attention is limited and it should all only be given to those tasks which are important now if we drive and while driving we use a cell phone this will be distracting imagine a situation when you are driving and somebody calls you now you take up this call or respond to him through a message while doing this action your attention from the road will be diverted towards answering this call or text messaging and because of this diversion of attention into an interfering task which is the call might lead to accidents you might have seen your driving licenses where it is written as a cautionary word not to engage in cell phone while driving but we are familiar with the situation where most people actually engage with a cell phone while driving it could be important calls or it could be just routine calls how does this become an engineering psychology problem think about it no matter how much cautionary words are given people will engage with their cell phones 
no strict rule will prevent people from using the cell phones so as an automotive company or a software designer for an automatic company what can i do to help people so that they can minimally engage with their phone while driving as i just pointed out caution is not going to help because people are people and they will engage with phones so some kind of modification in the design of the vehicle itself or the software system of the vehicle itself should be done which could prevent the cause of accidents or at least warn the users in very critical situations this is an engineering psychology problem and it can be solved in many ways now if you give this problem to designers who don't employ the scientific method or who try to solve this problem through intuition they will give you some solutions like add a warning system an audio warning which can prevent you from collision but think about this this is an intuition solution now if you are driving and you are paying your attention to the cell phone and an auditory warning which is loud in nature comes about it is going to cause more interference and lead to faster accidents than lowering down ex uh, accidents this is one intuitive solution which i thought i'll present and this is those solutions which are not scientifically tested so then what approach should be taken and what could be the solution to this problem finding the most scientific solution to this problem requires us to use research methods or principles of research in testing this problem across various conditions across various user types using user centered design collecting data proposing hypothesis and from that arriving at results which are then tested against modified designs so that some kind of accurate solutions can be provided to this question today's topic is going to introduce to you very briefly the research methods and how these research methods can be applied to problems in ergonomics and human engineering so let's then start as we discussed before there are two ways to look at a problem one is the common knowledge the common sense approach and the other is the scientific approach common sense approach uses intuition or people's own ideas into solutions but if these solutions are not tested against hardcore data there will be very less consensus among what should be the final solution to a problem so what i'm proposing here is a scientific method is using the principles of research into solving problem before going into the details let's discuss what is a scientific method a scientific method is a systematic unbiased 
an objective process of acquiring knowledge and this process is called a moral process. A systematic process requires you to carry out experiments, acquire data in a sequence of steps and these steps should logically follow. For example, proposing the hypothesis first, even before proposing the hypothesis, looking at research literature, from there pinpointing and choosing theories which may be applicable as a solution to your problem. From there proposing tentative solutions to the problem making designs to test these tentative solutions, engaging people into actually carrying out the proposed solution, collecting data from people who are testing your solutions against those uh, which serve as a control and then analyzing this data. Based on that analysis, proposing solutions and using these solutions to remodify designs and testing again. This whole process of doing research is called systematic. What is an unbiased system? An unbiased system of research involves no bias from the side of the experimenter, which basically means that the experimenter does not use his own intuitions and expectations into research and an objective process of acquiring knowledge involves collecting data that can be measured in terms of given parameters. For example, if I want to measure performance of drivers, then this can be measured in terms of number of errors that they do or in terms of how much time do they take in performing a particular task. So, here time or number of errors can be measured in terms of numerical values and they can be analyzed and this is an objective method. A subjective method here would be one in which people would express their opinion. So, scientific methods use systematic unbiased and objective process. What are amoral processes? Amoral results reflect truth as they are unbiased by any desired outcome or preconceived notion. We just discussed this a moment ago. While doing research, experimenters put their own expectations and own beliefs sometimes into the outcome. Now, by using certain sophisticated designs, this can be eliminated. For example, the use of double blind designs in which the people who make the experiments and the people who collect data are two different people. So, the biasness of the experimenter who has made the design will not come into the collection of the data because somebody else is collecting the data and he has no real knowledge of what the data comprises of and what is it being that is being tested. So, this is an amoral result or an amoral process of doing scientific method. In scientific method, the questions are critically evaluated through data and research as we discussed before. What happens in a scientific research is that the questions that we propose, the problems that we try to solve are evaluated with a hint of criticism, meaning which any result that we get is tested against so many criticisms, so many opposite results and when it is tested against 
so many criticisms or so many opposite results it tends to give you uh, a more accurate description of research what i mean by this is we should not focus on how to reach a goal or how to find similarities of a result in previous research rather we should find out what not to do in a research in an experiment because if we look for how many times or how many ways of failure in a particular research exist we will contribute more to research in terms of what not to do what to do is good but telling people what not to do in a research is better because if you eliminate what not to do you will finally reach to what to do so questions in scientific method are evaluated against what not to do as in criticisms and this is done through collecting data and doing research now scientific methods are known to be skeptical what is being skeptical no methods of measurement ensure all aspects of scientific method is used appropriately being skeptical requires that you use the scientific method and the measurement of the scientific method in a appropriate way this may employ operationalization of the variable which we'll discuss later in uh, this section and it will require you to use the method of measurement in a feasible manner being skeptical also means that you are not biased by your own intuition and biases but the result that you are proposing is based on facts so whatever results that you propose are not consisting of researcher's bias and his expectations and his beliefs rather it is based on hardcore data scientific method should be empirical in nature means that the knowledge that we gain the understanding that we have about a problem is based on observation we observe things in real time collect data and then test it against control data and then make our uh, results or come to solutions of problem we don't just sit and create imaginary solutions or propose hypothetical solutions to problem so scientific method involves the use of empiricism which is observing for gaining data and getting results out of this data to create knowledge scientific method is not common sense what do i mean by this common sense is what most people believe the correct solution to most problems what is common sense and if it is so common why is it wrong for example one common sense is that people while driving and looking at phone can respond to a third alert audio alert which can warn them through an accident zone or a accident situation think about it when the attention is diverted partly in driving and partly in looking at the phone and 80% of your attention is on the phone and 20% on driving which makes driving automatic an audio alert will take away all the attention and push it to the audio alert once you do that the automatic process of driving will get disrupted and you will perform motor actions which are out of sequence in the automation when i say something is automatic or something is habitual a sequence of motor actions are so well coordinated that they happen one after another 
without much conscious awareness. Now, when an uh, attention is pulled away from this job, there is a break of the sequence and then people may perform actions which are uncoordinated in this habitual thing. You would have often seen that when people get involved in an accident, a motorbike accident, instead of lowering down their uh, speed, they increase their speed. This is a habit and uh, this kind of action is a more natural action because people try to control the speed through their hand and the natural movement of the hand is in the clockwise direction which increase the speed rather than decreasing the speed because decreasing the speed is a anti clockwise direction it is moving against your natural sequence and so it increases speed. Now, common sense which says that audio alerts would actually help you is not true because if you use scientific method and test people's driving skills in these kind of situations where you have audio alerts and some other kind of modified alerts, we find that audio alerts are more accident causing. So, the idea of how common sense can actually at times create more problem should be avoided in scientific research rather the solution should be based more in terms of collecting data and analyzing result. Now, the main problem that we face in experimenting with people is that we are studying people who are complex, they are differing in major ways and are behaving differently due to learning, aging and situational factors. This whole thing can be summed in one thing that is called individual differences. People are different and these differences arise because of their learning, their expectations, their own habits, their ways of life and, and, and other similar things. And so, two people who are even born to the same genetic makeup, they differ. So, if people are so different, it becomes really difficult to study them through one kind of a design and that is why common sense or intuition based solutions are not the best solutions rather solutions in engineering psychology should focus more on the scientific approach. Now, given the fact that we are testing what kind of modification should be done in the car software system so that it helps people in driving while they can very briefly look into their phone. If that is the problem that we are looking, a step by step solution in the scientific way should be first done in terms of looking at the literature. Now, before going to the literature or before finding solutions to this problem of what design modification should be done, we should propose tentative solutions. We have a problem that is what kind of modification should be done in the car software system so that it assists the user who is driving in situations where his attention is diverted at other places. We also have to be very sure that these diversions of attention should be should not be for long. It could be a mon momentary uh, shift in attention. So, in those situations how does it work? One solution to this problem is the EDAS system which is the assisted driving uh, automated system which prevents accident, but how is this, this system come into being? Let us look at that. So, our problem here is to find out what solutions exist. Now, for finding the solution to this problem, we should first give some solutions as in what can be done, some tentative solutions and this process of giving tentative solutions is called proposing a hypothesis. So, implementation of the scientific method involves hypothesis testing. 
we give some possible solutions and then test the solutions against those groups of people who do not have the solutions. In terms of the hypothesis language, we propose a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis. We will come to that in a moment, but null hypothesis means that there is no difference between the newer design and the older design and alternative hypothesis means that using the newer design increases performance. Also performance has to be done in measurable ways for example, in terms of number of errors or in how fast somebody does something. So, this is how scientific method works. So, the start of scientific method requires you to do something called hypothesis testing. Remember in mind that we have a problem which says that what kind of solutions should be given to these software systems so that they assist the driving in situations where there is a momentary lapse of attention. Now, predictions made by researchers that is developed from observations and previous research are based on theory that must be testable statement. Solutions that people or researchers provide to these situations are based on theories. Now, these solutions that we give to hypothetical problems or to applied problems rather, they should be based on some kind of a theory. Some kind of a basic research should go into the making of these solutions and the solutions that we are giving should be a testable statement. For example, I may give a solution that in momentary lapse of attention while driving, one solution could be a tactile feedback from the car steering. This tactile feedback could alert the rider saying that his attention has varied and this level of vibration that the steering gives will define how extreme the situation is. Now, if you look at the theory behind this, there is a theory in cognitive science which says that there are multiple channels of input that the brain can receive. Now, when you are attention is diverted to the phone and driving two sensory organs which is the audition and the visual are already engaged. So, loading the auditory channel with an audio alert would actually be a problem because something called a psychological refractive period would set in and this would either degrade the second stimulus which is the audio alert or it would totally cut off the audio alert or if it is of extreme level it will allow the audio alert creating unnecessary motor responses. So, what is the solution then in terms of theory a third receptor a third input system can be engaged which is the tactile input. This is the theory and so providing a solution that I gave which is using a tactile response is based on this theory. So, this is how theory is used for giving solutions. So, we have a problem now which is what kind of modifications should be done to the uh, system. We have a hypothetical solution which is using the tactile system for giving solutions and giving feedback to the driver and the theory is that using a channel of input which is free is much better than using a channel which is already engaged. So, this is how hypothesis are or tentative solutions are 
proposed. Now, literature review will inform whether relevant theories already exist that address the causal rela relationship. How did I come about this kind of solution and this kind of theory? Arriving at this kind of theory involves reading literature related to problems which pertain to this particular situation. Reading literature related to attention and how signals from different audit input systems in the brain they compete with each other. What is a theory then? A theory is a set of testable assumptions or suspected relationship among variables that attempt to explain a particular behavior. A theory is assumptions which are done in terms of previous literature review or previous results in literature and these can be used into formulating hypotheses. Now, once we established a hypothesis an appropriate method and means of analysis are determined, data collected and data analyzed. So, once we have the solution ready we have to find a method of doing this research. So, we can create two groups one who will have this facility of tactile feedback and the other group which will not have this facility will have the commonsensical solution which is the audio input. We will put them into different driving situations collect data in terms of measurable outcomes either in terms of how many errors or how much time and then when we have these data compare these and based on them arrive at a solution as to which method is best. The analysis of data will employ the use of statistics. So, we will have to use an appropriate statistical method for collecting and analyzing the results out of these experiments. Now, remember we talked about hypothesis as tentative solutions. There are two type of tentative solutions. It may be possible that in one experiment, one set of experiment you get a positive result from your design. But if we do not repeat it across different situations, this design may not be beneficial in real life. This is real people we are talking and real driving situations that we are talking. In a laboratory when we do these experiments, the results of these experiments may not be applicable to real life. And so, proposing solutions which are tested only on limited number of people and few times may not be the correct solution. So, then how do we arrive at a more comprehensive result? The way to do this is to test our hypothesis against a null hypothesis. What is a null hypothesis? A null hypothesis says that there is no relationship between the variables of interest. In our case, it would say that improving the design by using tactile feedback is not going to improve the driving performance in terms of the more number of errors or more number of accidents that people do. An alternate hypothesis would suggest that by giving tactile feedback people get into lesser accidents and people have a faster reaction in terms of avoiding accidents than in those cases when no tactile feedback was given. So, null hypothesis says that there is no relationship between the variables and we have to test this and we have to then refute it reject the null hypothesis meaning that we have to collect so much data that this data will suggest that the no relation hypothesis is not true and the hypothesis which says 
the tactile feedback is going to improve performances in terms of causing lesser accidents is actually better. So, these are the two different forms of hypothesis. Now, there are times when we cannot reject the null hypothesis. So, I made an improvement by giving tactile feedback and supposedly in the lab it was working, but when I take it outside it is not working, it is not giving me significant result. It basically means that the number of accidents that people do under control conditions with no uh, feedback from the steering system and those in which there is a feedback they are equal. In this case what happens is the null hypothesis is equal to the alternate hypothesis which basically means that the alternate hypothesis is not better. Now, we are not able to reject the null hypothesis in this case. Now, non rejection of the null hypothesis is basically we could not say that it is actually leading to non working of our alternate hypothesis. So, not getting clear results does not mean that our new de design is not working because if the new design is not working could be because of many reasons. So, failure to reject the null hypothesis can arise from several different reasons. For example, there is uh, the lack of effect. It could be that the type of vibration actually was never expected by uh, the driver and because of that they could not understand it. So, the effect was not there. So, in this case we have to test the driver first introduce him to this concept of feedback all of a sudden if you get feedback from the uh, steering wheel you would interpret it something differently. So, this concept has to be first introduced to the driver so that he understands that this feedback is actually a warning system. So, this could be one of the reason it could be due to lack of sensitivity the feedback was such that it was not perceived by the uh, person who is driving some people are less prone or less sensitive to these vibrations and so they may not be able to actually feel the vibration and it could be due to flaws of design. There could be design flaws in terms of how the vibration is being captured and when it is given pre accident, post accident at the time of the accident if two events happen simultaneously the accident and the feedback happens simultaneously in time or very successively in time then it is of no use. So, it should be a prediction system which should happen before. So, that users get time enough to perceive this and then interpret it this is a design flaw. So, rejection of null hypothesis actually means that somehow there is a flaw and because of that the design is not working. It does not mean that there is no relationship between the uh, variable of interest. It is like what courts say if you go to legal courts they say that people are not guilty un until and unless they are having enough evidence to prove them guilty right. So, they are innocent basically. So, enough in evidence give enough evidence and then if the evidence is worthwhile then they could their crime can be uh, proven, but until enough evidence exists they are still innocent. The same approach has to be taken here that the designs work, but we have to somehow find what is the problem that is because of which the design is not working. Why this is there? This kind of approach is taken? This is because these designs that we are proposing is based on literature and theory and literature and theory has been tested extensively by earlier researchers. So, there is very less chance that it will not work and that is the approach that people should take, researchers should take in proposing hypothesis. Also remember that in hypothesis testing the most parsimonious results are the most correct, the most simplest results are the most correct results. If you 
make complex results or complex propositions. These complex propositions are connected through several processes and when several processes are in picture, one or other processes may fail. So, simple results are the best results and the most accurate results. So, step 1 is finding a problem, step 2 is proposing a tentative solution or proposing a hypothesis. Now, in engineering psychology and behavioral sciences, there are two types of researches we focus on. There is something called basic research which is for the sake of seeking knowledge and which helps in developing theory by controlling real world factors in order to focus on scientific questions of interest. Basic research looks at basic problems, it looks at those problems which are system based problems for and which if experimented with will give you theoretical knowledge. This theoretical knowledge would further lead to development of applied solutions. Let us take an example, how does the I see things? Now, basic research will involve studying the retina which is that part of the eye which helps in forming the final image. Now, the retina has specialized cells which can record changes in contrast and these changes in contrast can signal background and foreground or edges of a system. It also has specialized cells which can measure orientation of objects in the external field which can then be used to locate object in the external field and navigate the external field. The retina also has special cells which can record motion and this will help us in knowing when something is moving towards or against us. How is this possible? By studying the retina and the knowledge that we get from this kind of research is called theoretical knowledge because in itself it is not giving some solution, it is just increasing your knowledge about the visual system. So, examples of theoretical knowledge or basic research is be doing work with visual systems, developing of cognitive maps, problem solving in humans, all these problems, all these questions that are just named are basic research related problems. For example, how do humans solve problems? There are two possible ways of solving a problem. One is using an algorithmic approach and the other is using a heuristic approach. Algorithmic approach basically means that there are a number of steps to solving any problem and if we use these steps one by one, we will always arrive at a solution if there exists one. Making tea, if we form an algorithm to making tea and no matter how stupid it may suggest, but if we follow those steps, we will successfully make a tea. We could start with fi first finding a dish for boiling water, the boiling water requires to identify a heating system, then awning the heating system, putting the vessel on the heating system, putting water, letting the water boil, then in a stepwise manner moving forward to make the tea. But solving problems in this way requires a lot of time and a lot of effort and humans do not generally use so much effort in solving normal problems. So, they take a heuristic approach, a shortcut approach and what is a shortcut approach? A shortcut approach to making tea would require you to put all ingredients of the tea together into water and putting it in into a heating source and if you do that you will still get tea, but it may so happen that you may forget to light the heating source and because of that everything that you have had will still sit there and you would not get the tea. 
that you are desiring because you forgot one essential step which is igniting the heating source which provides the heat. Now, this seems stupid, but algorithmic approach says that if you follow step by step for uh, sequencing, you will always arrive at a solution. This is theoretical knowledge. So, theoretical knowledge says that what steps are essential and what steps are not and theoretical knowledge or basic research deals with this kind of problem. Now, if these are these are the two type of problem solving abilities, what kind of ability will be preferred and most beneficial in a problem situation can be extracted out of this theoretical knowledge. One example of a basic research is understanding the effects of various colors on emotion, whether colors affect emotion and the theory behind that is that colors are actually variations of wavelengths and different wavelengths of light excite the corn cells, the cornea of the eye and from there it passes on to the fovea which has the cones which is those specialized cells of the retina which respond to color. Now, excitation of these will lead into a number of process which through a higher process is going to affect a system which is very next to the emotion processing area of the brain and because of that, because of which wavelength of light is exciting which part of this fovea and how much amount of corn cells in the retina that will decide the excitation and this excitation will then pass on to the visual perception area and then further to this emotion area. So, there is a theory, we will not discuss the theory here, but this is the basic idea. So, this is a basic understanding or basic research. In comparison to basic research, there is applied research and what does applied research say? Applied research is conducted in order to address an actual real world problem. Basic research is theoretical research, applied research is real world problem. For example, the problem that we are tackling with whether there can be design modifications which can help drivers drive as well as divert their attention for few moments onto other activities like uh, watching the phone only for emergency purposes if there is a that kind of a system can be developed. This is an applied research. Applied research could also be in terms of what colors would lead to more happiness or more uh, number of customers visiting your shop and which could directly then lead to more buying. What store atmosphere? could be created that so people visit your store and make more purchases. These are more applied problems. Now, impact of color and mood, we just discussed landmark effects on navigation, how different landmarks can help you in navigating from one place to another and impact of cell phones or driving etcetera or applied world problems or applied research problems. Human factor researchers, they solve problem by reducing errors that causes problems at work and everyday life. So, human factors researchers, what they do is they provide solutions to these kind of problems that we just discussed, which are everyday life problems and what they do is they provide ways and better designs so that errors can be minimized and performances can be increased. As opposed to basic research, where theoretical knowledge is increased applied research borrows theories from basic research, modifies it, applies it in a modified design or modified solution and then finds solutions to everyday problems. So, that lesser stress, lesser error and increased performance can be achieved in uh, day to day, everyday 
uh, functioning. Now, let us look at some basic concepts in research. We have understood up till now what is a hypothesis, how hypotheses are designed, what kind of research exists and what is the basic of the scientific method. So, now we are ready to look at what kind of solutions exist and how these solutions can be implemented to solve problems. Let us again go back to the original problem that we had which is can designs be modified in such a way so that it can help users divert their attention momentarily to cell phones or other activities in cases of emergencies and can there be a way for software designers or car designers to provide a feedback to the user so that accidents can be prevented in such situations. Basically, diversion of attention can it actually work in a driving situation. Now, if we have just seen that possible solutions are there, for example, giving them tactile feedback, how do we test this? Testing these solutions require you to either use a study or an experiment and then collect data from the study and experiment and then analyze this data. For starters, let us look at what is the difference between a study and an experiment. In day to day language, study and experiments are interchangeably used, but then there are major differences between study and experiments. What are those? Study involves no manipulation of experiences people encounter. In a study, we observe, we do not change anything. For example, if we want to look at how consumers purchase products in a showroom versus a mall, what we could do is we can observe people in real time while they are buying. Here we are not changing anything in the consumers, we are sitting and observing and so we are not manipulating the experience of people while they are buying. We are just studying how people are buying. This is a study. Now, everything is, is studied as in meaning no change. As we just discussed, so if we are looking at how people shop, we do not change how people shop we do not instruct them ways to shop, but rather if we go into the environment in which they are shopping and study what necessary steps they are taking, how they are deciding, what kind of choices they are making, what kind of movements that they are making, where are they going and how are they shopping. So, nothing is changed here, we are observing people while shopping in real time. So, everything is studied as is, as normally as somebody would or consumers would shop. Study does not guarantee the establishment of causal relationship between variables. This in turn affects interpretation of result. Now, in a study, there is no guarantee that a causal relationship can be established between the variables of interest. For example, if we are interested in knowing whether a certain redesign of the mall can lead to better purchase experiences, this kind of causal relationship cannot be established. At the best what we can do is, we can look at people going to buy under two designs and then see how much did they purchase, but think about it. Let us say person A buys more under better designed malls than under poorer designed malls and we are just observing them buying. It could be that person A has more interest in this product or he likes the experience of shopping or that on a certain day 
he requires certain products more and so attributing that design of the mall or his shop of interest is leading him to buy more can at the best be guessed. We cannot make a cause and effect relationship that change in design is actually making him buy because a number of other factors are also working which we have no idea about. And so, the interpretation of results in a study where variables are not controlled is very bleak. On the other hand, we have experiments which are more controlled in nature. Now, in experiments, researchers control the experience of the participants that is manipulation of variable is possible. In the same experiment, we can create a hypothetical mall and then deliberately put people under two different malls, remove everything else since this is a hypothetical situation. So, all those motivations and needs and habits they will be taken care of. So, we put them under hypothetical situations where they have to virtually purchase something and every other thing which can affect the behavior of people's purchase are removed. Then people are tested on against two formats of design of the mall in a virtual environment. And if after this testing, the design of interest leads to results which show that people purchase more, we can say that this change in design is the reason for more purchases. So, in this case what has happened is, we are testing only one variable, eliminate all other variables and we are manipulating this variable which is the design. In study, we cannot change the mall design. We can test two different malls which are two different designs and we cannot also make the same person go to two malls. So, we have to study different groups of people, but in experiments, we can create these designs changes in the malls, in virtual malls and study the same group of people under two conditions. Now, we are controlling for mall design and also the participants who are participating and thus we have more control. Now, in, exper in experiments as variables are manipulated in control fashion, determination of causation is possible. As we just discussed, we can control the design, we can control the people who are going into the mall and we can also control what they are buying and how they are buying. And so, we have more controlled environment. In this case, if the newer design malls lead to more hypothetical purchases, we can say that design modifications lead to more purchase. What is the difference between a study and an experiment? In research, both terms are generally used interchangeably. As we have discussed before, studies and experiments are thought of as a filler for each other in more generic sense. Both studies and experiments are empirical method in the sense that we observe and then collect data. We do not hypothesize or create hypothetical data. Experiments are more used as they alone explain relationship truly. Mostly experiments are more powerful and they are used more because they can be more correct as they allow for manipulation of variables of interest and control of extraneous variables, those variables which can lead to alternate results or desired results. In our mall case, experiments can control specifically one factor this is design and can control other factors for example, your interest of people in certain products or the experience of shopping, these factors can be controlled. The motivation to shopping can be controlled because it is a hypothetical mall, so you have nowhere to go. And so, design effects on purchase can be studied in a more concise way. The third kind of experiments that are used are called quasi experiments and what are these? They appear as experiments, but they are truly studies. So, uh, 
seems like they are experiment quasi experiments these are false experiments in which they work like experiments we use two different groups but technically we don't manipulate anything within the groups and so they are truly studies although individuals have different experiences these differences are not controlled or manipulated by the experimenter in the same mole exp experiment that i just discussed if we want to look whether males and females perform differently in terms of mole designs we could use a group of males and we could use a group of females and we can find differences but the problem here is that we cannot change in males into females and we cannot also decide how these males and females would process information would purchase at the best what we can do is we can use two groups of males and females and study their shopping behavior so these are quasi experiments wherein we are obviously taking males and females and studying how males and females or whether the gender has an effect on purchase but we cannot control who the males are and we cannot have a equivalent female in the other group now what is the meaning of equivalence as in in terms of intelligence it can be but technically we cannot have a copy of the same participant in the other group examples include comparing men and women as i just said we can have men and women but we cannot have an equivalent counterpart and here too causation is difficult because it could be because of personal factors the results that you get could be because of personal factors so in today's lecture we looked at some basics of research methodology and how it is applied to engineering psychology we looked at what is the scientific method we discussed experiments and studies and we also looked at the difference between applied and basic research and hypothesis what is hypothesis testing in the next class we'll continue from here and look at more concepts in research till we do that it is thank you namaskar and goodbye from the mook studio Thank you.